This sermon was recorded at the Church of Christ, Northwest Arkansas. We are Christians seeking to worship God in spirit and in truth, according to the New Testament. Come worship with us Sunday mornings at 1030 at 1708 Elm Springs Road in Springdale, Arkansas. Good to see everyone here today and uh, glad for those that are visiting. We're glad to have you with us. We're in the midst of a two-part study on miraculous gifts. There's been an interest expressed in that and how the gifts were given and uh, do we have miraculous gifts in this day and age because many people believe we do. I, I can't go back and give you the whole lesson from part one last week, but let me recap it for us. And you'll see it here on the outline, actually. Uh, this outline is just incidentally, it's like last week's outline, except it has part two written on it instead of part one. At least the front part is, but of course the the other parts of it, the scriptures are different, so you need uh, you need uh, charts on both to have the complete study. And incidentally, also, this is on podcast, and so if you missed last week and you want to catch that first part of it, you can listen to that audio, and uh, if you'll see Ben or David or someone like this, they can give you the links to that. Probably some others can, too. I've lost my link, and... Uh, so I don't, I don't, uh, I don't hear me anymore, or any of you. So uh, Ben probably will send me one of those one of these days. Now that I've said this, he'll send me a link. So I'll have one here before long. Um, let's go back and recap. I introduced some thoughts here out of part one with the scripture you see right under the title, Hebrews thirteen eight. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. And it seems that those who believe in miraculous gifts often cite this scripture because their thinking is this, that since Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, we had miraculous gifts yesterday, therefore we ought to have them today. That seems to be the reasoning. But this, this passage, as I've told you, is not talking about miraculous gifts. It's talking about Christ. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Lord was holy yesterday. He's holy today. Be holy forever. He was merciful yesterday. He's merciful today. He'll be merciful forever. Anything you can say about Jesus in regard to his character and nature does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But when it comes to the will of God and to different covenants that God's made with man, that has changed. God gave, for example, laws on sacrifice back in the Old Testament. We don't sacrifice animals today. Is it still the will of God that we offer bulls and goats? No, he's changed his will, hasn't he? He has different covenants with men in different ages of man's existence here on earth. When it comes to miraculous gifts, the, the real issue here today is not what God can do, it's what he's willed to do. See, God has the same power he always has had. And when you deny the existence of miraculous gifts, you're not... You're not denying God's power. You're just not. Because God may have willed not to exercise His power in that fashion, like He once did, and He has. Uh, if I didn't believe God had power today, I'd quit praying, wouldn't you? There's no need to pray for the sick if God can't help them. What are we doing mouthing prayers if we don't believe that God has the ability to help folks? What we're talking about here is what man could do, not what God can do. The question is, has God given miraculous gifts to men? It's not a question of what God can do. He can do anything He wants to. He has all the power He's ever had. And I showed you that God doesn't flash about His power for the fun of it. God has purposes for miracles. He, he, he always has, and, and uh, sometimes people don't understand God and His purpose. But God seems to begin things with miraculous things, and then perpetuate those things by divine laws and principles. And I, I took you back to creation last week. And we talked about when God began to create the heavens and the earth, He did so miraculously. And one of the things that He created was vegetation. In Genesis 1.11, remember this. God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. So when he spoke vegetation into existence, he did it miraculously. Now God can still do that today. 
The question is not can he do that today, does he will to do that today? Does God create trees out of nothing today? No, Genesis 1.11 says that when he created those things out of nothing, he said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. So he placed the seed within those plants. And when we, when we want a certain crop, then we sow the seed, don't we? God doesn't have to keep creating it miraculously, you see. He perpetuates it by divine laws and principles. He's done the same thing with the human race. In Genesis 2 and 7, when he created man, the Bible says the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So he made the first man out of dust. He doesn't create men out of dust today. He can, but he placed within man the ability to reproduce, didn't he? When he created the first woman, what did he do? Caused the sleep to fall on Adam, the Bible says. And then he opened his side and he took out a rib and from that rib he fashioned this beautiful woman and gave her to the man to be his companion. And he created the first woman in that way. Can God still make a woman out of a rib? Absolutely. Does he though? And the answer is no and he's limited himself in that. He gave us the ability to reproduce male and female and he told us to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. There's been a lot of replenishing going on when you look around the assembly today, hasn't there? Beautiful little children. And God just as much created them as he did the first human beings when he made one out of dust and one out of a bone because he gave that principle of life within us to reproduce after our kind and told us to do so. And uh, so he, he chooses to create human beings in that fashion today. We're not limiting God's power when we say that he doesn't operate in some particular way today, that he's changed his will in regard to that. Not at all. It's just the, the question is, what is God will to do? So God never just works miracles for, you know, for the pleasure of it or gives that power to men for that purpose. There's always a purpose in his miracles. Now, Jesus did a lot of miracles, so I took you back through the purposes for the Lord's miracle working, and he needed to work miracles too. Because he came to this earth, and he had to establish that he was the Son of God. There had to be some proof, some evidence to make us believe. And without his miracles, we wouldn't believe in him as the Christ, the Son of God. We had to be able to believe that he spoke the words of God and his miracles. Give us that faith, and indeed, he has a message from God. This man spoke the word of God, this Jesus of Nazareth, and he is the Son of God. <clears throat> when he did his first miracle, he was at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Remember, they ran out of wine, didn't they? Christ commanded six water pots to be brought, to be filled and brought to him, and they did. And he changed that water into wine and furnished the guest with wine then to finish the feast. The Bible says there in, in John 2.11, this beginning of miracles, did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. You see, it produced faith. The disciples believed on him. John 3, 1 and 2, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So Nicodemus saw the miracles. And he said, nobody can do what you're doing unless God's with him. So he understood that Jesus had the power of God, and he believed. And these miracles that Christ worked were for the purpose of producing faith in him. So when you open up Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll read that Jesus walked on the Sea of Galilee. You'll see him open the eyes of people that are born blind as you read these miracles. They're written to produce faith. You'll see that he took bread and multiplied it. One occasion fed 5,000. Another one, he fed 4,000 plus men or plus children and, and, uh, and women. 
probably 12 to 15,000 really when he got through multiplying the food on that occasion. Vast numbers fed with hardly any food at all. Mighty miracles. He raised three different people from the dead, Christ did. Lazarus of Bethany there in John 11 is one of them. A widow's son of Nain, remember, that he raised from the dead. Jairus' daughter <clears throat> that he's raised up. So Jesus did all kinds of, of mighty miracles like that. And because of them, John recorded some of them. John said many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So they're written so that we might believe, you see. And we wouldn't believe in Christ without them, without these great miracles. So he needed that power. And then the apostles did great miracles because they had a mission. Take the gospel to every creature on earth in their day. And they did that. If you'll read Colossians 1 and verse 23, Paul said this gospel was preached to every creature under heaven whereof I, Paul, have made a minister. They actually took it to the known world in their day. But they couldn't do that without miracle working power. You see, there was no written New Testament in their day. And when Peter or Paul or someone entered a strange city, they were unknown to the inhabitants of that city. And they came preaching this man Jesus, that he died and rose the third day. How were people going to believe these rank strangers and this strange message of some fellow named Jesus that had risen from the dead, that died on a cross outside Jerusalem? Why would they ever believe these messengers and that message? Because these men were able to do miracles and they got their attention. So Peter might come into a town and uh, he might see a lame man. He could invoke the name of Jesus and uh, raise that man up, cause him to walk in the name of Christ. That got people's attention because Peter didn't have a New Testament. He couldn't say, turn to book so-and-so, chapter so-and-so, verse so-and-so. wasn't written yet. And here he's trying to preach and have people believe his message, and they would not unless some way the message could be confirmed that it was from God, and these men were messengers from God. So God enabled them to do great signs, and, and of course he confirmed their word. We read in Mark 16 and 20 of the apostles that they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. So Jesus would grant them the ability to do these miracles like he did, see, to confirm the message. Finally, I showed you last week that some in the early church also had miracles. That we talked about God and miracles, why Christ needed to do miracles, why the apostles did miracles. But I showed you that other folks in the church had this power because, <coughs> excuse me, when an apostle would go into a village, go into a town, and he'd preach for a while, or even one of the evangelists. They would establish a congregation of the Lord's church there, but the church, you see, had no written New Testament. It hadn't been written yet. How was the church going to be taught? The apostles, the early evangelists, had to move on. Other cities needed this gospel. Timothy never stayed anywhere to become the preacher. But the church that he was leaving behind, for example, had to be taught. How would it be taught? God gave miraculous gifts to certain members of local churches where they could carry on the work of the church. So one man might get the ability to prophesy, another one the gift of tongues, another one revelations, another one interpretations. And so in their assemblies like this, the Holy Spirit would move on an inspired person, give them a message directly from God, they could take the floor then and orally just deliver that message that the Spirit had given. If someone had just gotten a tongue from the Holy Spirit, he might get up and, and impart what knowledge was in that unknown language and someone across the room over here might have the ability to interpret and they would stand up to and the Holy Spirit would enable them to interpret what this one just said. 
And in that way, the early church and these congregations could be taught until such time as a New Testament like this could be written down. And we wouldn't need those miraculous uh, revelations like that because we would have the written word, you see. But for a time, the early church needed that. So Paul told the, the church at Corinth, let me give you this example and then we'll move into the study today. <coughs> In 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 26, he tells them, How is it, brethren, when you come together, every one of you have the tongue, have the psalm, have the tongue, have the doctrine, have the revelation, have an interpretation. Let all things be done undedifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course. And let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Verse 29, he said, let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For you may all prophesy one by one, that all may, come, all may learn and all may be comforted. So he gives instructions to these inspired men on how to conduct themselves with these miraculous gifts. To take turn, to keep good order, to not interrupt someone else who is speaking until they finished. All of these things were regulated. He tells the tongue speakers, if you don't have an interpreter, you keep silent because nobody will be edified. They won't be able to understand you. Do not speak in a language unknown to the assembly. And so God regulated these gifts, you see. Now, we've shown then God and miracles. We showed why Jesus did them. We showed why the apostles needed that power. And we showed why others in the early church needed this power. And that brings us now to part two of the study today, having recapped that for you from last week. And as I said, you can get the podcast. You can listen to it. The question this morning I want to deal with is, how were these gifts given? How were they given? How did people get miraculous gifts back then? We have people that claim to have them today. How do they think they're getting them? Let's look at how they were given in Bible times and see if that's, see if that's possible in our day and age to get them in this way. There were actually two ways back then that miraculous gifts were given. One of them was not very common, and that's the one I want to mention first. People were given miraculous gifts through a baptism of the Holy Spirit. A baptism of the Holy Spirit, directly by Christ through a baptism of the Spirit. Sometimes people were given these gifts. That only happened, as far as we know, twice. Acts 2 and Acts 10. And I want to read both of those examples. These are two examples of Holy Spirit baptism. The first one, of course, would, would occur in Acts 2 and the other one in Acts 10. But I want to go back with you. If you'll turn on the back side of the front sheet, you'll see Joel chapter 2 today. Joel 2. And I, I want to look at a prophecy that Joel gave regarding the coming of the Holy Spirit. Joel 2, verse 28 to 32. Now this was prophesied hundreds of years before Pentecost Day. Joel says, It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out of my Spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So Joel said that it would come to pass that God would pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. Note those, those two words there, all flesh. Back in that day, there were only two kinds of flesh, Jewish and Gentile. And God said, I'm going to pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, both Jew and Gentile. And this actually literally happened. The example where it was poured out on the Jews is found in Acts 2. If you'll turn to the second sheet of Scripture now, 
be the third page here, uh, basically, if you count back and forward to front. <coughs> if you'll look at, at that, uh, Acts 2, verse 1 to 4 with me. Let's read that together. The Bible says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now here's the day of Pentecost, and notice now, the Spirit is poured out, and the Bible says that it sat upon each of them, that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. These are the apostles. I'm going to show you that in just a minute. These are the apostles that received the Spirit that day, and they're the only ones that got it. There are some people today that claim, well, I'm Pentecostal today because I've got what they got on the day of Pentecost. And what they don't understand is only the apostles got this that day. I'll show you that in just a little bit. Notice now that the Spirit was poured out here and uh, we're told that they began to speak with other tongues. In 1 Corinthians 14, 22, we read, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them which believe not, but for them which believe. Put a little bit more clearly than that, tongues are assigned to the unbeliever. Prophesying serves for believers. So prophesying benefits believers more, tongues benefit unbelievers more. And that's the purpose of them. Now, over on the front, on the right side, you'll see two examples of Holy Spirit baptism. Notice this first one. It's the day of Pentecost. We just read it, Acts 2, 1 to 4. The Spirit fell on all the apostles. They all spake with other tongues, we read there in Acts 2. Tongues are assigned to unbelievers. The unbelievers are the Jews, thousands of Jews that have come in that day to keep the feast of Pentecost. And the gospel was offered for the first time to the Jews after Christ's death on this day. But when it first went forward, there was a baptism of the Spirit. So this first baptism of the Holy Spirit fell upon the Jews and it was at Jerusalem there, and it was the first day, the first time that the gospel was ever preached after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, when salvation was offered for the first time to the Jews after the Lord's death. There was first a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now there's one other example of a baptism of the Spirit, and it's in Acts 10. And incidentally, in Acts 10, salvation will be offered the first time to us Gentiles. Acts 2 was to the Jews. And now here's Acts 10. And this baptism of the Spirit will be for the Gentiles who are being offered the gospel now for the first time. And let's read the record here in Acts chapter 10. And if you will... Read with me from, uh, let me get the right verse right here. Got so many pages, I'm going to have to get them turned over correctly. Acts 10, 43 to 48. Peter's preaching now. He's come to Caesarea to the household of Cornelius. And he's been preaching a little bit about Christ, his death and resurrection. In verse 43, he says of Jesus, To him give all the prophets witness, that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. <coughs> Peter is, is down at Joppa on this occasion. 
And God sent an angel up north of him there to a city on the sea coast called Caesarea. There's a man of Cornelius, a man named Cornelius. He's a Roman soldier. And God has chosen him now as a Gentile to be the first to receive the gospel after the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. But he wants Peter to do the preaching to him, but he knows Peter won't go. You see, Peter's a Jew, even though he's a Christian. And Jews don't associate with Gentiles. They don't eat with them. They don't go in their homes. And he knows that Peter's been raised that way, and even though he's a Christian, he will not go into this house of a Gentile because up to this point, no Gentile's been offered the gospel. So God gave Peter a vision down there at Joppa. A sheet was let down from heaven with unclean animals on it, and Peter was told to kill and eat. And he refused. Lord, I've, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And God told him, what I've cleansed, don't you call it common. And that was done three times in the vision taken up to heaven. In the meantime, messengers had arrived from Cornelius to fetch Peter. The Holy Spirit told him to go with them. And he took six Jewish Christians with him from Joppa up to Caesarea. And we just read here where he went in and preached to them. God had gotten his attention and showed him by that, by that uh, vision of unclean animals that he was about to cleanse the Gentiles. And what he was cleansing, Peter was not to call common anymore. Peter went in, found them there, and preached to them about Christ. Then we read in verse 43, he said of Jesus to him, Give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. There's a baptism of the Spirit. See? <clears throat> and we read that they spake with tongues and magnified God. Now tongues are for a sign to unbelievers, and the unbelievers here, in this occasion, are not the Gentiles. They are the Jewish brethren that have come with Peter, who do not believe that Gentiles can come into the church yet. This will convince them, and Peter will tell them to be baptized. Uh, let's notice on the right side now, in the bottom part, the house of Cornelius, over there on the right bottom. Acts 10, the Holy Spirit fell again, this time on all the Gentiles. They spoke with tongues and magnified God. Tongues are assigned to unbelievers. The unbelievers were the Christian Jews with Peter. And salvation was offered for the first time to the Gentiles. So here's your parallel. You got a second baptism of the Spirit right here in Acts 10. This time on the Gentiles. This is the second time. The gospel is preached at this time for the first time to us Gentiles. So in each case, when the gospel first went forward to all flesh, Jew and Gentile, when God poured out His Spirit upon all flesh, the gospel was offered for the first time, in each case, to Jew and to Gentile. See? But they were preceded by a baptism of the Spirit. This happened twice. And miraculous gifts were given <clears throat> on both occasions. Those who were baptized in the Spirit spoke with tongues. As I said, this baptism of the Spirit happened twice. It wasn't very common at all, was it? You would think today as these <clears throat> folks who think they have this power talk that it just happens all the time. It does not. It didn't happen all the time back then. Now I want you to notice in Ephesians 4 and 5, there's a statement that's very important. Paul wrote to the Ephesians between 61 and 63 A.D. Let me put those dates up here. This is important. 61 to 63. He was in prison at Rome when he wrote the epistle that we call Ephesians. He wrote four epistles during this imprisonment. He wrote Philippians, Colossians, Ephesians, and Philemon. Let me say that again. He wrote Philippians, Colossians, Ephesians, and Philemon during this imprisonment, right here during these four years, or th two years, three. <clears throat> so Ephesians was written these dates. We can pretty much prove that. 
Now, in Ephesians 4 or 5, when he writes them at that time, he said there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So when he wrote Ephesians, by this time, there's only one baptism. Remember, there had been water baptism. That's the baptism of the Great Commission. And we saw two cases of Holy Spirit baptism. So you got water and spirit baptism. But by the time he wrote Ephesians, there's only one baptism. Now here's the point to this. If we have Holy Spirit baptism today, we can't have water baptism because there's one baptism. If we have Holy Spirit baptism today, we can't have water baptism because there's only one baptism. So the issue then is, is it water or spirit? Is that the one baptism? Which one? But both can't exist. So if somebody tells you today they've been baptized with the Holy Spirit, if that literally happened, there's no water baptism today because there's only one baptism. See that? That's important. But if water baptism exists today, Holy Spirit baptism doesn't. That's important. And so if Holy Spirit baptism doesn't exist, exist today, and it doesn't, we've got no way to get miraculous gifts that way. That only happened twice. Water baptism, we know, is the one baptism today because Jesus, when He gave the Great Commission, He told me, and you go teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded, and yo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. <coughs> so this baptism, this water baptism, was the last to the end of the world. We know that's the one baptism then that Paul talked about in Ephesians 4, 5. And therefore, we don't have spirit baptism. Because only Jesus could administer spirit baptism. The Lord administered it on both of these occasions. But it's men that baptize with water. And we're commanded to go teach all nations and to baptize them. That's water baptism, see. The Lord never baptized anybody even when He was here on earth. Did you know that? Read John chapter 4. Jesus never baptized one person. His apostles did it. And maybe because the Lord didn't want folks thinking, well, my baptism's better than anybody else because Jesus did mine. You just had baptism by Peter. I had it by Christ. See? So the Lord just didn't baptize. He let His apostles do the baptizing. He taught baptism, but he never did it. They did it in his place. Okay? <clears throat> but he did baptize with the Holy Spirit. And he's the only one that can. Men cannot baptize with the Spirit. Christ can. And Jesus has done it twice. And now there's one baptism, and that's water. So you see, that takes care of this first way of getting the gifts. You can't get them today through a baptism of the Spirit because baptism of the Spirit doesn't exist. Why? Because there's one baptism. Okay. Now, <clears throat> that leaves another way that these gifts were given. And I really, really want you to watch this because um, this was the main way in which the gifts were given. The gifts weren't prominently given through these baptisms of the Spirit. That only happened twice. There's something, however, before we leave baptism of the Spirit that I want to show you. <clears throat> I mentioned that a lot of people today say, well, uh, you ask them, well, why are you Pentecostal? Why, why do you consider yourself Pentecostal? They'll say, well, I have what we believe that we have what they got on the day of Pentecost. And, uh, of course, the question is, what who got? And they think they think there were a bunch of people on the day of Pentecost that were baptized with the Spirit. I want to show you before we leave uh, Holy Spirit baptism that only apostles, only the apostles were baptized in the Spirit that day. Turn to the back of the front, <coughs> the front page, look on the back side. <coughs> and let's notice some things here. I want to take you to Acts 1. 
at verse 21 through 26, and then I want to read also Acts 2, verse 1 to 4, the next chapter. Chapter 1 of Acts ends at verse 26, and then chapter 2 starts. But sometimes we forget that men put the chapters in the Bible. I'm glad they did. But when you come to a chapter here, that's been inserted by man. God never put the Bible in chapters. It just, when you picked up the book of Isaiah, the Old Testament, it was just a book. There were no chapters and verses. Made it kind of tough to find things. See, But uh, man's come along now and given us chapters and verses, and that's fine. I'm glad. But sometimes we, we have a tendency to think, well, when a chapter ends, the thought ends. And sometimes it doesn't. It comes right on down into the next chapter. And the men that put the chapter there put a chapter but you see, the thought is still continuing on. wasn't a good place to put a chapter. <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> that's kind of the case here in Acts 1 and Acts 2. In Acts 1, they're picking a successor to Judas. Before Pentecost Day, Judas hung himself, didn't he? That left 11 apostles. And Peter recognizes we need a successor to Judas. And David had predicted in the Psalms, and Peter quotes it, that someone would take Judas's office. And uh, now they stand up to do that. They're meeting to do it. Acts 1 now, verse 21. <coughs> Peter said, Wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until that day in which he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Now notice the apostles had to be eyewitnesses of the resurrection. You could not be an apostle without being a witness of Jesus' resurrection. That's why we don't have apostles living today. Nobody's seen Jesus after his resurrection today. You had to be an eyewitness of it. Back in that day, there were plenty of them. <clears throat> so he said... We got to have one here ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Verse 23. They appointed two, Joseph called Bersabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whither of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Now note that word. He was numbered with the eleven apostles. Now let's read on into chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Who is they? They is a pronoun Referring back to the noun apostles in verse 26. See, this is 126, and the last word in it is the noun apostles. <clears throat> then you start Acts 2, 1 to 4, and you run into six pronouns. So let's just quote 126 again and come right on down through Acts 2, 1 to 4, and notice the pronouns referring back to apostles. <clears throat> they gave forth their lots, the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they, the apostles, were sitting. And there appeared unto them, the apostles, cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, the apostles, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. They were all filled, the apostles, with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them, the apostles, utterance. See, only the apostles were baptized with the Spirit that day. And all of these pronouns here in Acts 2, verse 1 to 4, refer back to the noun. Apostles in Acts 1, 26, those pronouns modify nouns, and they modify other pronouns sometimes. <clears throat> so, you can see there the connection. The Spirit that day 
these people that say, well, I want what they got on Pentecost Day. You're talking about what the apostles got because they were the only one that got the Spirit that day. Now, let me give you a little challenge in your studies. When you're studying, read from Acts 2 up to Acts 6. And between these, these chapters, Acts 2, Acts 3, Acts 4, Acts 5, you'll never find anyone working a miracle in the early church except the apostles. I want to challenge you on that. You just got to read about, what, four chapters? Acts 2, 3, 4, and 5. See if you can find where anyone worked a miracle in those chapters other than an apostle. The reason is because they're the only ones that got the baptism of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Nobody else worked them up until we get to chapter 6. Now that's important. In chapter 6, something happened. But I'm leaving off a, a little something. I wanted to give you more evidence about the apostles. I want you to read there on the back of the front page, uh, Acts 1, 9 to 11. Luke here, who wrote Acts, records the ascension of Jesus back to heaven. Luke says of Christ that when he had spoken these things, while they, while they beheld, he was taken up in a cloud, received him out of their sight. While they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. Now, the apostles were all from Galilee. And here in Acts 1, he says, You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? The apostles were the witnesses of his ascension. They're on, they're on the Mount of Olives. And Jesus speaks and he's taken up from them. <clears throat> and he said, the angel said, you men of Galilee. So notice, first of all, the apostles were from Galilee. Now go to Acts 2, there at the, below that one, and look at verse 7. Day of Pentecost. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Friends, listen. Everyone that spoke in tongues on the day of Pentecost was from Galilee. That's what the apostles were. See, I've just showed you that the apostles were the ones baptized with the Spirit. Everybody that spoke in tongues that day was from Galilee. Behold, are not all these which speak Galilean? See that? Just the apostles. <clears throat> Drop down to verse 14, Acts 2. When Peter stands up to defend what's going on, the Bible says, but Peter standing up with the eleven. He stood up with the eleven. He didn't stand up with a big multitude to defend all of those that were speaking in tongues because only he and the other eleven were just the apostles, and they were all men of Galilee. See, I'm just showing you evidence after evidence in Scripture that only the apostles that day were baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's very important because people seem to think today anybody can get that. And the truth is nobody hardly got it at all back then. Just the twelve. And as I told you, between Acts 2 and up to Acts 6, Nobody in the early church worked a miracle but the apostles, not that we have record of. If tongues and things like that were common, we should be reading about it, but we're not. But in Acts 6, that changed. I want to show you the change. <clears throat> you see, in Acts 6, the church started having growing pains. You know, when you, when you start having larger memberships, when your family gets bigger, you've got bigger problems, don't you? It's like raising your kids. There's more squabbles. There's more boo-boos. There's more things to tend to. There's more sickness. And it's that way in the family of God. You can have greater problems in larger congregations sometimes. Um, and the early church began to grow, and it started having this problem. The Grecians, and that means the Greek-speaking Jews, started murmuring against the Hebrews, the Hebrew-speaking Jews. You see, every day the early church passed food out to the widows. They took care of their widows every day, daily. 
And these poor widows had their needs taken care of. But for some reason, the Grecians thought that their widows were being neglected. And they murmured about it. And all of that reached the ears of the apostles. And the apostles could have stopped their work and they could have served tables every day. They could have fed widows. They, they weren't too good to do that. But Peter and others knew, we've got preaching to do. It's not reason that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. So they told them, look you out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost, that we can appoint over this business. Now if you'll drop there with me now on this, uh, I believe it's your third page in. Hope it is. I want you to notice Acts 6, verse 5 through 8. Acts 6, 5 through 8. I'm going to skip a couple of verses here. We read that the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Now remember, they're picking out seven men. Incidentally, every one of these will be Grecians. These are all Greek names. They chose Stephen. Let me make some room here. A man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. So I want you to notice in verse 5, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Stephen is full of faith and the Holy Ghost. See that? They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Now notice the second choice. Philip. I'm going to write his name up here too. And then he starts naming the other men here. Philip. He names Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, the proselyte of Antioch. Every one of those are Greek names. The early church saw, showed us how to solve problems. The Grecians were the ones murmuring, so they picked Grecians to serve the food every day. That means if any of these Grecians murmured in the future, they'd be murmuring against Grecians. That's pretty smart, isn't it? They picked seven Greeks and uh, might tell us a little bit about how to solve problems. That's pretty fair, isn't it? <laughs> they said, all right, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll pacify you Greek-speaking Jews. We'll just put all Grecians doing this. That stopped the murmuring right there. See, that's pretty charitable, isn't it? That's love. Okay, I just wanted to point that out. It has nothing to do with what we're studying, but I wanted to show you that. Now, <clears throat> notice that Stephen here in verse 5 is full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. We read on here now when they choose the others. Verse 6, whom they set before the apostles, and when they would prayed, they laid their hands on them. So let me make a note of that. They laid hands. The apostles laid hands on them. <coughs> the word of God increased. The number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now watch verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great miracles and wonders among the people. Stephen now is filled with what? Faith and power. What was he filled with in verse 5? Faith and the Holy Ghost. He just had the simple indwelling of the Spirit, not miraculous. Now he's had the laying on of the apostles' hands. Now he's full of faith and power. Now what does he do? He does great miracles, wonders, and miracles among the people. Stephen is the first Christian other than an apostle to work a miracle after the day of Pentecost. Now there might have been someone else, but they're not revealed in the Bible to my point. And he had the laying on of the apostles' hands. Who else got it that day? Philip. See, he was the second one named. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Ghost, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, and he names the others. Okay. Now, now look at uh, Acts 8 with me. Let's follow Philip a little bit. Acts 8. 
verse 5 and 6. <clears throat> the Lord decides it's time to preach to the Samaritans, and he sends Philip. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Philip is the second one other than an apostle who's said to be able to do miracles. And he had the same laying on of hands, the apostles' hands that Stephen had here in Acts 6 because he was chosen along with him. And the apostles laid hands on him. So the apostles could lay hands on people and impart miraculous gifts. They're the only ones that could. Nobody else could. And those that had these powers could not pass them on. Philip's here at Samaria, but he can't pass this power on to anybody. He's working miracles. So let's look at Acts 8 now, verse 13 to 19. Philip's had a lot of success. He's established the church there in Samaria. <clears throat> verse 13, we read, Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he uh, continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Verse 14, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, two apostles, who when they were come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. <coughs> Excuse me, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Now watch this. When Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. So he tried to buy that power. He saw that the Holy Spirit, that these miraculous things were given by laying on of the apostles' hands. See that? So Philip had the power there at Samaria, but he couldn't pass it on. So Peter and John came down to Samaria, prayed that, that these Samaritans would get that power, and then God granted that prayer, and they laid hands on them and imparted to the Samaritans then these miraculous gifts. It was done by laying on of the apostles' hands, just like Philip had gotten it and Stephen had gotten it. That was common. Now look at Acts 19. I want to show you this again. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul. Paul was an apostle. He's come to Ephesus where Apollos has just left. And let's notice what happens here. We read, It came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said unto him, We've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Now Paul knows their baptism is no good because they, uh, they're supposedly disciples, but they haven't received the Holy Spirit. They hadn't even heard of Him. So he asked the men, he said unto them, verse 3, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. Now John the Baptist didn't baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I don't know by what name he baptized but he did not. They hadn't heard of the Holy Spirit, yet they'd had John's baptism. And John's baptism at this time had ceased because John's baptism was only for Jews. It was only for Israel. And uh, it was for those that were children of God to bring them back to repentance. It's unlike the baptism that we have today in the Great Commission. And so Paul knows there's something wrong. They've had John's baptism, and he knows that ceased. Verse 4, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So Paul rebaptized them, didn't he? And when Paul had laid his hands on them, watch this. The Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied and all the men were about twelve. So when Paul rebaptized these twelve men at Ephesus, he also laid hands on them. And what happened? The Holy Ghost came on them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. 
What was Paul? He was an apostle. What could they do? They could lay hands on you to give miraculous gifts. And here's another example. See, I showed you this from Acts 8. I showed, or yeah, Acts 6. I showed you another example in Acts 8. I showed you Acts 19. I'm going to give you one more, 2 Timothy 1 and 6. <coughs> 2 Timothy 1 and 6. Paul told Timothy, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance, that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. So Timothy, Paul tells him, I, I, you're, you've got a gift in you that's been there by the putting on of my hands. Paul had laid hands on Timothy and given him a miraculous gift here. And so he reminds him of that. You see, the apostles could do this. Other men could not. Now here's what you and I need to understand about how these gifts were given. They were given two ways. Number one, through a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, Acts 10. Now there's one baptism. That's water baptism. We don't have Holy Spirit baptism today. Therefore, there's no way to get the gifts that way. The main way they were given, however, was through laying on of the apostles' hands. And of course, I gave you all these examples. Acts 6, Acts 8, Acts 19, 2 Timothy 1 and 6. Four examples. We don't have apostles today. Do you know anyone that's seen Jesus? Is there anyone that's an apostle today? Now the word apostle means one cent, but I'm talking about apostle in the sense of the twelve. Like the twelve Jesus gave. No, we don't have any of those, do we? And since we don't have these apostles today, then, then nobody's had hands laid on them by an apostle. And so they don't have these gifts. They've had an emotional experience of some kind, evidently. They do not demonstrate the power. They cannot do the miracles Jesus did. You don't see anybody doing those today. <clears throat> I challenge those folks to just go to a hospital. If they've got this power, start going to a hospital. And just walk around to the different rooms on different floors and ask those patients, would you like for me to pray with you? Could I lay hands on you? Could I have prayer with you here? And if they've got this power, they should be able to heal that person, shouldn't they? They could demonstrate that real clearly. But you see, they want to have these big rallies, these big crusades, these big tent meetings. Because they've got people there planted. They've got everything staged. It's all set up to deceive. Not a one of these fellows that claim to have this power can walk across a mud puddle, much less the Sea of Galilee, without sinking. Jesus walked on water, can they? Can they raise the dead? I don't see them at any funerals, do you? I don't see them going to a funeral home and raising the dead. Why not? Christ went out right to where a man had been buried and laid four days. Been dead four days. Don't know if he'd been laid there for four days, but he had been dead four days. Lazarus in Bethany <coughs> told him to remove the stone and he raised the man from the dead. We got cemeteries all over this country. Just walk out to one of them and get permission from the authorities to open the grave if you need to. Raise the person. That's all they've got to do. But you see, they don't do things like this. It's always a hidden cancer. It's some demon of some kind uh, that's bringing addiction. It's, it's always something that you can't validate. I don't see them putting back on bodies, missing limbs. We've got war veterans with with limbs missing, don't we? They could restore them. Jesus put the ear back on the servant of the high priest. You can read about it in Scripture. Took a missing ear and put it right back on the fellow and healed him. Because the Lord had this power. That's the difference. And we've got deceivers and we've got people today that have been deceived claiming to have this ability today when they do not have it.
There's no way to get the gifts. And folks, listen, as I close the study, the Bible tells us the gifts weren't meant to continue. And Paul tells us that. He had the gifts, and he's the one that said they weren't going to continue. 1 Corinthians 13 now. Let's read verse 8 to 10. <coughs> Paul has talked to the church at Corinth about love or about charity. And he writes there in verse 8, Charity never faileth. That is, love never fails. But whether there be prophecies, let me write this up here, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, and he's talking about miraculous knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, now watch this, we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. What's he mean here? He tells us then that prophecies are going to fail. Tongues will cease. Miraculous knowledge like this is going to vanish away. And he said, we know in part. And, and, and he said, we prophesy in part. The New Testament, when it was put together, came piece by piece, part by part. Miraculous knowledge, we know in part, was imparted in part. In other words, different writers and others got this material. It came in part. Prophesying was done in part. But he said, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part, and that's the miraculous knowledge and the miraculous prophesying and such things. When that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. Now this word perfect, if you'll do a word study on it, means complete. Complete. <clears throat> and it's put in contrast with that which is in part. And he's talking about the completed revelation. He don't, he's not talking about perfection, even though this word is perfect. He's talking about something that's complete. And when the complete comes, what's in part will be done away. He's not talking about Jesus here. He didn't say when he who is perfect is come. He said when that which is perfect is come. That which is in part would be done away. And so... These gifts were to last until the perfect or the completed revelation was given. And you see, then we wouldn't need the, the, the gifts. We don't have to have the Holy Spirit today give a revelation to one of your brethren where you can stand up and take the floor and deliver a message to us. Why? Because we got that which is perfect or complete. Where did I get this lesson this morning? Right here. Right here. The Holy Spirit gave me this lesson today. Right here in the scriptures. I don't have to have a miraculous gift to preach to. Because I've got that which is perfect. And that which is in part has been done away. There's no way to get the gifts. How were they given? Through a baptism of the Holy Spirit. But there's one baptism today and that's water. Secondly, through the laying on of the apostles' hands, we don't have apostles today. There's no way to get the gifts. So, I hope that helps us a little bit understand that we're not limiting God's power. God has chosen not to give the gifts today. If we needed them, He'd give them. He's got all the ability He ever had. He can give man miraculous power. Now don't leave here and say, well, Brother Manning told me there's no need praying because God can't do anything. Brother Manning didn't tell you that today. <laughs> Brother Manning tells you that if God can't do anything, you need to quit praying, but God can. You keep praying. What I'm telling you today is no man can work a miracle by virtue of an abiding gift from the Holy Spirit. God, he can do what he wants. We don't limit God. That's the truth. 
And that's the study today, and I hope it's beneficial. There'll be a few extra copies of this uh, left. We'll lay them out on the desk. There's some from last week if you want part one. Uh, there's a few of those lying there. Feel free to take these as long as they last. If you need extras to pass out, well, feel free to get them. I know it's been a long study today. I thank you for your patience. But this lesson, this study today is important. It's important because 